hello, everyone. My name is Mary Ann James Daly. I am the Director of Public Services for this lovely building, the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library. Welcome. If this is your first time here, 5,000 welcomes. If this is your return back after being here, welcome back. If it's your first time here after the modernization, super big welcome, because we had a mega glow up with this building. So I am here to welcome you on behalf of DC Public Library. We are, again, like I said, excited to have you all here. We are wonderful, wonderful partners with We Need Diverse Books, and we are happy to host the Walter Awards here again this year. Please do not be a stranger. We have lovely programs and services here. We have abundant books here. We have enthusiastic workers here who can point you to the right book if you don't know. I am going to introduce Ellen O, um, who is the co-founder and CEO of We Need Diverse Books. Good morning. I'm just so glad I didn't fall. I'm at that age where I trip on nothing. So, you know. Anyway, welcome to the ninth annual Walter Dean Myers Awards uh, ceremony. I'm Ellen O. Oh. I am an author and a founding member of We Need Diverse Books. And I have served as CEO uh, in a volunteer, volunteer capacity for the last 10 years. <laughs> so on March 15 in 2014, two very important op-eds were published in the New York Times. The first was by Walter Dean Myers, who asked, where are the people of color in children's books? And the second was the apartheid of children's literature written by Chris Myers. Both father and son asked an important question. What is the message when some children are not represented in children's books? These essays were a call to arms, a demand for change. At the very beginning of both essays, there was a statistic quoted that said, of 3,200 children's books published in 2013, just 93 were about black people, according to a study by the Cooperative Children's Book Center at the University of Wisconsin. As an Asian American, I happen to know that that same year of those 3,200 books published, only 18 were about Asians. I know this because my first book, Prophecy, was one of those 18. <laughs> at the end of Walter Dean Meyer's essay, he stated, there's work to be done. A month later, a hashtag went viral. And by July of 2014, We Need Diverse Books had become a nonprofit, answering the call that Walter Dean Myers had asked of us, all of us. In 2014, only 8% of children's books published that year were written by authors who are black, indigenous people of color. 10 years later, we've seen that number jump to 45% annually. That's over a five-fold increase. And it's directly tied to our nonprofit's advocacy, our membership, our programming, and the support of all the wonderful people who work in children's literature. Now, while we know the rise of book bans is a direct result also of all of this hard work, we're not going to talk about that now. No. Because today, today is a celebration day. Today, we celebrate the legacy of Walter Dean Myers. We celebrate all the librarians and teachers and writers and illustrators and booksellers and publishing professionals, parents and everyone else who supported WNDB from the very start. And most importantly, we're going to celebrate by welcoming our incredible 2024 winners and honorees. And I know, like you all, we cannot wait to hear from them today. Now, I also want to extend our deepest thanks to the Walter uh, award judging committee who dedicated hours upon hours of their time to read over 600 books and select winners and honorees. So please will the 2024 Walter judges stand so we can acknowledge all of your hard work. Thank you so much. I also want to thank our amazing WNDB team, Caroline, Caitlin, and Alyssa, and our Walter chairs, Kathy and Yukari. They have worked so tirelessly to make this event happen so that all I had to do was show up. So 
Please stand, where are you? Come on. <laughs> I want to give a big shout out to all the students in the audience who represent eight local schools. Thank you for being here. All of you are the reasons why we have this award and why these books are published. These books are honoring, that we are honoring today are written for readers like you. I hope that all of you will have lots of questions for the authors during our Q&A. Now, I am thrilled to introduce to you our MC for the 2024 Walter Awards because I'm sure that many of you, like me, are huge fans of Elizabeth Acevedo. <laughs> she is the young people's Poet Laureate and the New York Times bestselling author of The Poet X, which won the National Book Award for Young People's Literature, the Michael Prince Award, the Pure Bell Prey Award, the Carnegie Medal, the Boston Globe Horn Book Award, and the Walter Award. <laughs> She's also the author of uh, With the Fire and High, which received the Walter Honor and was named a Best Book of the Year by the New York Public Library. <laughs> <laughs> and Clap When You Land, which was a Boston Globe Horn Book Honor Book and a Kirkus finalist. So please, let's welcome Liz Acevedo. Good morning. Okay, we got a little energy. I like that. I like that. I am so hyped to be here. I received this invitation and I saw who the winners and honorees were and I just knew that I needed to be here on this day to celebrate with them and for them, the amazing work that they put out into the world. And so I hope that all of us have a lot of energy and are here to engage and listen to the ways that they talk about how they came to this work and, and what this work means to them. And hopefully we'll walk away reading these books and loving these books and figuring out what they mean to us. Now I'm gonna be very scripted. Um, <laughs> good morning. No, I'm kidding, okay. <laughs> Ellen, you're the best. Thank you for that introduction. I really do appreciate it. Um, I'm Elizabeth Acevedo. I am your moderator. And on behalf of We Need Diverse Books and in our collaboration with the DC Public Library, I'm delighted to welcome you here to this award ceremony. We are here today to celebrate this year's winners and honorees and to honor the life of the awards namesake, the late Walter Dean Myers. Myers was not only an award-winning and prolific author, he was also a tireless champion of diverse children's literature. Since his death in 2014, We Need Diverse Book has strived to carry on his legacy, and in the 10 years since his passing, the organization has donated over 100,000 diverse books to schools and libraries, and it has supported hundreds of diverse writers and illustrators through its mentorships, workshops, and grants. These creators have now collectively published over four million books, and many of them have become best-selling and award-winning authors. Right? That's a lot of books, y'all. I like how to double take. I was like, is this a typo? This is real? Wow, that's amazing. But the work we're here to honor today is also under attack. As many of you have seen in the news, book bans have spread at an alarming rate in the US. In the first eight months of 2023 alone, the American Library Association tracked nearly 700 attempts to ban library books, a 20% increase compared to the same time period in 2022. In the first eight months of 2023, 700 attempts to ban books. That's wild. That's wild. Even worse, many of these bans target diverse voices. Take a look at the most challenged books across the country and you'll find many diverse authors on the list. That's why our theme this year is, there is work to be done. A quote from Walter Dean Myers himself, as Ellen pointed out. WNDB selected this theme because while we've accomplished so much in the last 10 years, we recognize that the road ahead of us remains a long one, but we are hopeful too. Let's look around this room at these wonderful winners and honorees who have written brave and inclusive stories, at the teachers and librarians in the audience who understand the powers of diverse books and do all of the work to ensure that their students have access to the stories that they need and don't know that they need until they're put in their hands. Yes, there is work to be done and we are here to do it because we all know that books are precious and they can even save lives. I'd like to welcome our winners to the podium and I'm gonna be calling folks up to make remarks. We're gonna start with our young adult winner, Ari Tyson. Thank you. 
I gotta give you her intro though. So I love the applause and I need you to applaud again when she's coming up to the stage. Ari is an award-winning Brie Brie, American poet, essayist, educator, orthoenographer, and author of YA hybrid novel, Saints of the Household. Her short stories have been published in Our Shadows Have Claws with Algonquin Young Readers and Relit with HarperCollins. Her poetry and essays have been published in various literary journals, including Poetry's First Issue for Young People. She has an MFA from Hamlin University, and now teaches in the MFAC program. Ari, please join me at the podium. Thank you. I can't believe I just got to hug her. Um, hello, friends. I'm so honored to be with you all in this moment. Thank you to We Need Diverse Books for creating this award and the countless opportunities you've heard of already in this field in service to both writers and young readers for the last decade. Numerous books this award has honored have been mentor texts to me through the last 10 years. Works by Andrea Rogers, Angeline Bully, Jason Reynolds, Elizabeth, <laughs> um, and Daniel Nayuri. All have helped me on my way, and I know I wouldn't be the writer I am without them. I feel so honored that Saints now gets to herald a great elder of all children's literature, Walter Dean Myers, whose legacy is the world of books for young people. His legacy is unmatched. Thank you to the committee uh, who put in tremendous work. Thank you for giving so much of yourself. I promise to pay it forward. Such love to fellow finalist Hannah Sawyer in this category whose book changed my life already and I'd fight for it anywhere. A big thank you also to my team, FSG, my lovely editor, Grace Kendall, um, Elise is here also, and my marvelous agent, Sarah Crow, who are all with me today. Also, love to my creator for giving me life and my people's story. I feel more now than ever how sacred life is in a world where there is so much ugly and children are dealing with horrors contemporarily that my peoples and other tribes have faced in our own histories. May we continue to fight for them and hear them. Saints of the Household is a story that follows two brothers from my tribe who are facing their own obstacles and fears in their home life with an abusive father. This is a book about family monsters, brotherhood, intertribal relationships, and how our indigenous stories, the stories of our people, our culture, um, and artful expression and faith can help us find healing after enduring much pain. This book made me braver in my own healing journey just like books did when I was a young person. Books like Speak by Laurie House Anderson and Nikki Grimes' Bronx Masquerade, all of those books spoke to me when I was in middle school and high school um, and heard me in their pages when nobody else did. As writers for children, I am astounded by the power of stories. Today, I wear a necklace from a Pueblo reader that, that symbolizes um, native elements to her tribe. Um, there's stone, and then elements native to mine, uh, shells. And it remains a symbol of connectivity of reading to me. Through books, we are woven together with our, our own experiences and the experience of others. It reminds me that as writers for kids, I love that we don't work, do this work only to see ourselves, but also write so that children and young people can also hold the world more truthfully and fully and see themselves as a part of it. As Walter Dean Myers wrote, what I wanted, needed, really, was to become an integral and valued part of the mosaic that I saw around me. We need to see both ourselves and the mosaic in books. As an author, this means getting to share my piece with you too, holding onto the shells and this necklace alongside the stone. And because of this, I'm so grateful that I got to provide this book for you all. And also just in time for my Brie Brie teenage brother to find saints on the shelves of his high school's library. <laughs> this award to me means both recognition of my people, but also of the readers out there. Folks are growing and are ready for books like mine, when there might be little to no framework of knowing about me or my people. Our tribe is incredibly small. There are only five Brie Brie's in the entire United States right now. Right, so how spectacular to be heard. To me, it is an action that We Need Diverse Books is known for. 
It's a great encouragement that diversity isn't a checkbox or a way to pit art against each other, but ra rather diversity is reality. We humanity contain multitudes. Therefore, for our art should carry the same reality and publishing should strive for this. Anything less is untruth. The theme of today is that there is work to be done, and I both congratulate us for being here and give encouragement for all of us to keep going so that the world of books looks like the world. Thank you. Amazing, congrats. I'd like to introduce our Young Readers winner this year. Jacqueline Woodson is an American writer of books for adults, children, and adolescents. She's the GOAT, right? She's done, it's not in the official one, but like she's the GOAT. But right, here's why she's the GOAT. She is known for her National Book Award-winning memoir, Brown Girl Dreaming, and her Newbery Honor-winning titles after Tupac and Dee Foster, Girl Dreaming, I'm sorry, Feathers and Showway. Her picture books, The Day You Begin and The Year We Learn to Fly, were New York Times bestsellers. After serving as a Young People's Poet Laureate from 2015 to 2017, she was named the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature by the Library of Congress for 2018-2019. She was awarded the Hans Christian Andersen Medal in 2020. Later that year, she was named a MacArthur Genius Fellow. I just need y'all to put your hands together and give all your energy to the Jacqueline Woodson. I wrote my speech on my phone, which means I'm officially in the 21st century. And um, I just want to say thank you all for coming out. Um, thank you, Nancy Paulson, my editor, who always understands what I'm trying to do and helps me get there, and the Penguin Random House team that has been supporting me for decades, because I'm old. Um, and um, I was thinking this morning how Brown Girl Dreaming is celebrating its 10th year, and We Need Diverse Books is around the same age. And I remember when we Need Diverse Books started really amplifying around all the Brown Girl Dreaming stuff and around BookCon, where um, most of the panels at the, it's not called BookCon anymore. It is called BookCon now, right? What's it called? We don't, oh, it's gone. We got rid of that, they, you know? And that's what happens when you don't do the right thing. You go, so. <laughs> But um, just amplifying diverse voices, and um, I'm just so proud to be a part of it now um, and to watch the metamorphosis and the change that can happen in our lifetime. So yesterday in Brooklyn, I ran into Kaze with her mom, Kaneza. Her dad, Chris, was heading home from Australia where he'd been installing a stunning piece of art an Afrocentric nod to Hera and Argus on a 12 foot tall quilt. I love this beautiful family. They are smart and talented and loving. Both parents are well over six feet tall and Kaze at four years old is often confused for a child much older. When Chris was a kid, his dad dreamed of him playing basketball Anyone who has ever met Chris knows he's not that kind of tall. <laughs> he is awkward and artsy and so dynamic. Instead of being a basketball player, he has spent so much of his adult life bringing into art the visual image of giants, interrogating ideas of race and gender, myth and truth, history and who gets to tell which stories and how. His father, Walter Dean Myers, would have been so proud of this trio. One evening, I am told, Kaze put the picture of her grandfather in front of her and stared at it as her grandmother, Connie, Walter's wife, read to her from one of Walter's books. She's that kind of kid, really. And she's also Walter Dean Myers' granddaughter. And he would have loved her. And he would have loved this room. And WNB, WNDB, doing the work, and the books being awarded. He would have grinned and been flattered about an award being named for him. And then he would have most likely said, no thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 
and made a joke about it, making him feel like he was dead. <laughs> and from where he is now, he's probably grinning and proud and still. He would have said, the work goes on as it always does. I'm not keeping this award. I'm going to cherish it. I'm going to love the stickers that my publisher is going to buy to put on my books. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to hand it off to Kaze. Remember us as the story of looking back. We must always look back in order to go forward. I am so grateful to have known Walter. He was a dear friend to me. In Kaze's eyes, in her four-year-old sense of humor, I see her grandfather often because I spend a lot of time with that child. In this moment, with all of you doing the work, I see a future. And like Walter, I am grinning, I am proud, and I am grateful. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much to our winners for your wonderful words. You're going to be able to hear from them in a little bit. We're going to be having a conversation. But first, I'd like to make sure that the honorees um, get their round of applause and get celebrated. And so I'm going to introduce you to our two honorees who are here with us today. First, I'd like to introduce Hannah V. Sawyer, who is one of my favorite writers. Um, but that's just a tidbit. She was recognized as the Youth Poet Laureate of Baltimore in 2016. Her spoken word has been featured on the BBC's World Have Your Say program, as well as the National Education Association's Do You Hear Us campaign. Her written word has been included in Essence, Galdum, and XO Nicole. She holds a BA in English from Morgan State University and an MFA in Creative Writing from the New School. Sawyer is an English professor at Loyola Marymount University and lives in Los Angeles, California. All the Fighting Parts is her debut novel. Hannah, will you please stand up so that folks can celebrate you? Jamila Tompkins Bigelow is a Philadelphia-based anti-racist author of popular children's books. She is a Walter Dean Myers honoree and an Irma Black Award silver medalist, and her books continue to make many best of lists, including Time's 10 Best YA and Children's Books and Books Riot's 20 Best Children's Books of All Time. Please put your hands together and celebrate Miss <laughs> Jamila Tompkins Bigelow. Unfortunately, Jamila's co-authors for Grounded, Aisha Saeed, SK Ali, and Huda al Rashi, weren't able to join us today, but they are here with us in spirit. Ari, Jacqueline, Hannah, and Jamila, will you please join me on stage? As you know, the Walter Awards was created by WNZB, who are celebrating their 10th anniversary this year. In the spirit of that, I'm wondering if you could tell us about where you were 10 years ago in your writing journey. All right, Spicy question. <laughs> <laughs> I was a mom of a four-year-old who just had a baby, mm -hmm. um, so I wasn't writing yet, mm -hmm. and I was falling in love with um, picture books during this time, mm -hmm. children's books especially, and, um, and the four-year-old is actually over here. But hey. <laughs> yes. Shout out to Lisa. He's actually very important. <laughs> I remember feeling, I was falling in love with all these books, but I was feeling kind of a sadness um, because I really wanted to see black Muslim children in books. Yeah. And I really couldn't even find, there are very few even ch uh, Muslim children in books, period. Um, and black kids and black boys in books. And I wanted to put black Muslim boys into books. I wanted, wanted my son to be in books, so I didn't pick up a pen until like 2015, the next year. Mm. But um, 10 years ago, that's what was happening, was I was like thinking about that. So that was where yeah. I was in my writing journey. 
I want to point out, like, <laughs> Jamila said, I didn't even pick up a pen. And I'm like, that baby was still only a year. And you were like, all right, time to get well, to work. I had, I had a baby and he was four. Yeah, so I was like, yeah, I had my oh, two Oh, that's boys. right, right. Yeah, I had my two sons. And I was reading to them and I'm like, you know, yeah, so I was busy. You had a little time. one. And but I was like, the next year I was like, okay. Had been, yeah. Now they've grown, time to work. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Ten years ago, I was saying earlier, brown girl dreaming had just won the National Book Award, and I'm not gonna go into details about what happened at the National Book Award, but though, okay, um, it's okay? You can hear me? Okay, good. He's like, stop touching that mic. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was, it was time for change, obviously, and as yeah. we talked about, um, WNDD was forming. Oh goodness, I had a five-year-old? And um, wow. someone who was six years older than he, he was. But I had been writing for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, but really taking, I feel like that was a point where we were really taking a hard look at what was going on mm -hmm. in young people's literature and seeing the places where it was, there was a lot of change and still places where there was so much work to do. 10 years ago, um, I was a high school senior. And I was annoying. <laughs> Don't do that. She was fierce. She was a fierce writer as a high school senior, writing people under the table. I was yeah. a really annoying writer. I was annoyingly passionate, which I encourage. I really do. Um, I was writing in like the margins of my notebook when I should have been paying attention in class. I don't encourage that so much. Um, <laughs> well, actually, no. Okay. Yeah, I'm like, wait. <laughs> um, I was obsessed with going to open mics. And I grew up in a really, really strict household. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these open mics I was not supposed to be at. And I was <laughs> lying about my whereabouts. That I really don't encourage. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I knew that I really, really loved words. And I really, really loved poetry. Um, and I just wanted to be submerged in that world, very annoyingly, too. Like I remember like going up to poets who I thought were inspiring and just being like, I like, that was so great, just being a wide-eyed high schooler. And I think all of that, you know, helped with where I am now. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I was a really annoyingly excited writer, and I encouraged that. I think we would have been good friends. I was also a senior in high school. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and um, I, I was kind of, I do tell people I was annoying, too, because I, I was like, um, I mean, I, so I, I grew up in a pretty, like, really, really kind of, Awful childhood house, um, but it, but my reaction to that was kind of like overachievement, and mm -hmm. I kind of had to make my own way. I really wanted to go to college um, in Minnesota, where I grew up. There's this free program where you can go to college for free mm -hmm. if you go in high school, um, so you can get like two years of college for free. Um, and I knew that was the only way I was really going to be able to like even maybe attempt to get a master's mm -hmm. degree. Um, so I was doing that. So in high school, I was taking classes um, as many as I could in my local colleges. Um, but when I was 18, I, I saved up enough money to buy myself a like a couple month long novel writing workshop at the local Laugh Literary Center. Um, and so I was working on my first novel, It's Not Saints, but the, the, um, for, I, really, I was really, really working hard. And I'm, I'm really proud of the energy that um, I had at 18. I, I have like a two-year-old now, and like I'm married and whatever. And I just, I just think about the energy that she put in um, at the time and all the work she did, all the, the craft she learned, the tenacity, the annoyingness, yeah. the not giving up, mm -hmm. the writing whenever she could. Um, and, and I'm grateful for that because that effort has, you know, has allowed me to, to be where I am at today. Um, and so I'm grateful to her for that. I'm thinking about the ways that you all are he here being honored for a specific book and how every book teaches us something about ourselves and our mm -hmm. process. And I'm curious what you hope this book that you're being here honored for will show readers and what this book showed you. So Remember Us is the story of a girl, Sage, who is a really great basketball player, which I'm not, but you know, you can make the characters into whoever you wish. <laughs> <laughs> and this is before the WNBA, this is before um, girls had a lot of options about sports, especially mm -hmm. basketball. Um, and it really, and, and at one point she gets kind of bullied for this. Um, and I think what it showed me was um, how many more, even though the world feels so limited in so many ways when it comes to 
our bodies, whether you know they're cis female or female presenting bodies, um, that we still have so we have so much more. We have so much more in terms of gender. We have so much more in terms of how we present ourselves in public. Um, and, and, and it made me grateful for that. I mean, it made me grateful for the past in order, as I said earlier, to like make me think of the present, what we have now. Right. Um, and, and I hope other people get the yeah. same thing out of it, that this, this is a journey, right? Yeah. right this right, is right. a movement and, right. and, and it's a, it, the change sometimes feels like it comes really quickly and sometimes it's very incremental. Mm -hmm. So the text really had you kind of reflecting on time in a different way and uh, I think sometimes we get impatient. Why hasn't change happened already? <laughs> yeah. Versus, yeah. oh, we're, we're just in progress, hopefully. We were just talking about this last night actually about how it's so important to have hope in books for young yes. people and sometimes that mm -hmm. means skipping ahead at the end so that, mm -hmm. so that you know, young people, y'all know that it can get better, you know, or there's a situation that maybe we can't fully change, but that there's time ahead of you. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think about that for Saints when I was writing it. I, um, I was really intentional about, I mean, I, I know that like the book Speak was really important to me um, and really influential in my life. And, and I also found that like on the other side of, you know, dealing with a monster or something uh, that that there was so much like trauma and like responses mm -hmm. and like bodily responses like ptsd or depression or dif difficult things that i didn't know would happen like you know sometimes we get the fairy tale story of the, the dragon being slayed and then you know they just happily ever after well you know sometimes they have ptsd <laughs> you know? um, and, and so i wanted i wanted to have a a, a, a book where it it didn't just end in a certain way where you know everything was kind of done and finished. And, and though those are important moments, we need to celebrate those. Like those books need to be, those books were part of my life and give me bravery. I also wanted to show kind of what happens after. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, and then opportunities for healing. Like we need, our, we need our arts, we need our forms of expression, we need our obsessions, our friendship, our community, and our generational relationships, right? All those things, faith all are part of healing. And so that was really important for me. Um, and I hope that that's what young readers get. What I want young readers to get is what I needed to, ooh, <laughs> forgot that was there, <laughs> um, is what I needed to learn. Uh, my book is a Me Too novel. Um, my main character is assaulted by a popular community figure who's her pastor. Um, and I think I, for a very, very long time, I experienced a lot of self, um, like a lot of shame, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of self-blame. Um, and I think it took me, it wasn't until I was an adult that I actually really, really believed like it is not your fault. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I, when I was like a young person, like I would read all the articles, like I read all the pamphlets. So it's like I would know those things, but it wasn't until I was an adult that I was like, now that I'm an adult, keep forgetting that's there. <laughs> now that I'm an adult, like I feel so strongly about protecting young people. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I can't imagine like being someone who doesn't want to protect mm -hmm. young yeah. people. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so all of those questions that I had, um, all of those things that I used to tell myself to blame myself, I look at that and I'm like, thank God I've gotten to a place where I can look at that and be like, that was not true. Yeah. Um, and even though I was a young person, I was convinced that that was true, it wasn't. And I'm just really, really grateful to be in that place and get to write that book. And I'm hoping that, coming again, I'm hoping that young people who read my book who have been through something similar can take that message with them too. Mm -hmm. So Grounded, um, I have to mention the other authors, right? Mm -hmm. Be, um, because you know, I was one of four. This is like, I think maybe the, I'm not sure if there um, has ever been an, a novel authored by four right. people, mm -hmm. um, a cohesive one, right? But uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, so for, for myself and Huda and SK and for Aisha, um, this was a really important, book to have for our community. And it's interesting because it's a romp. Mm -hmm. um, it's an adventure story. It is meant to be funny. It's meant to be lighthearted. It's meant to be about the personal struggles that the children, the, the Muslim kid characters are facing in the story. But we didn't want it to be about 
our Muslim identity on the line, sort of our struggle with our Muslim identity mm -hmm. and how we experience pain because of our Muslim identity. And we hadn't really seen very many books like that where the characters just happen to be Muslim and don't really have to explain their existence mm -hmm. in the book. You know, they can be in an adventure story, they can be in a fun story and, and kind of, um, uh, you know, um, you know, basically, you know, an aspirational story where they can lose themselves in an airport. And so, you know, and, and a space that's kind of traditionally fraught for Muslims, right? And yeah. sort of just be there and run amok of that space. This book just taught me that we can do it um, and that we will continue to do it, but also, yeah, that all kids really just kind of deserve to be in the book, even the, those very pain, the books about our personal pain, but also those books that are just that other kids, you know, that the typical white boy gets to be in, you know, yeah, honestly. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> we can be in those books too, and so that was very important. It was very important for me to have a book like this. I'm thinking about your bios and how your bios highlight all the amazing things you've done. And sometimes the bio like is so long and you get up there and you're like, like that joint is one thing and I'm another, right? And um, I can imagine that a lot of people would look at you all and be like, success, success, right? Like you are the goal, right? And sometimes the way the world sees and the way we define success is really different. I'm thinking of, um, Tiana Taylor has a song called We Got Love and Lauren Hill does this like, monologue at the end where she's talking about success and she's like, you know, the money, the fame, like if you don't have integrity, if, if you don't realize your value is internal, what does it matter? What does it mean? And for me, that has become such a huge thing I play back as to how I think about success. And so I'm curious what each of your individual definition of success looks like and if you could share that um, especially because there's young people in the room and it's like so often the message that one can hear can be really different than what what maybe it could should or what will what will nourish us that message of success can be different. And maybe your message of success is like, I want 100 million followers, right? That's cool. I'm not judging anybody. I'm just curious about the diversity of answers um, around, around success. We all come from storytellers, yes. right? And so I, I think about that for my people. I'm like, you know, none of us have had our stories in this kind of way before. Um, and so, um, and this moment doesn't particularly, I mean, it's important, but it's not, it doesn't really, matter as much as that our stories have existed for thousands of years if they have had the muscle to do that. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what I'm proud of. So when I think about being a storyteller, it's, uh, I think about the word siwa, which is our word for story in Brewery. Mm -hmm. It also means history and wind mm -hmm. and knowledge. These things mm -hmm. are not material, right? They're in our minds, they're in our souls, they're part of us, um, but they're, and then they continue on past mm -hmm. us, right? Um, everything has a story. How this chair was built has a story, right? Yeah. Uh, everywhere the materials came from, who made it, yeah, yeah, all those things, right? Um, and so, but, but how does it exist? How can we make another one? Because of story, right? So it, it's this thing that, that is beyond us um, to me. Um, and so that helps me get grounded because it, I really, I enjoy, you know, everything's a gift. I, I, I want to take things as a gift. This is a gift to be here. What an what a honor. Um, but also, um, the, the, the way, the reason why I'm even here is because of something that is, is, is beyond the, the physical, and I'm grateful for that. I love that word, integrity. I also love that monologue at the mm. end of that song. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I think ultimately we write for reader, like the ultimate like, end result is the book gets in your hands, hopefully. But so much of my writing is also very selfish. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I write because I have a lot of things that I need to figure out. And it's very, very important that I address those things honestly. Mm -hmm. Plus, I think success for me when it comes to writing is confidently taking risks. Mm -hmm. um, I love books that are funky. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love funky formatting. I love like the books where I can tell like the author may not have thought that could have worked at one point, but yeah. they pulled it off and yeah, it worked. Yeah, yeah. Like that is something that excites me. Um, so I'm going to go with um, integrity and risk taking. Like those are two things that are very, very important to me. And if I can do those things, I feel like the book is a success. Yeah. Mm. I, I like to feel like my work is opening spaces for other authors mm. um, who are, you know, or people who are coming up who are seeing similar things. Um, 
and, and, and they know that it's possible, right? So when I look at, um, you know, for example, when I look at the work of S.K. Ali, right, then I knew it was impossible to write YA and write romance, and you know, as a Muslim author and have that sort of identity, very, you know, be in the book in a certain way, a very specific way. And so for me, um, when other people are taking inspiration, when other people tell me that they feel like they want to write a book because I have written something, when they feel like, oh, it is possible to, to have you know a romp about with Muslim kid characters in it, then that for me feels very successful. You know, I think my success has been doing what I love mm -hmm. um, and making that choice to do mm -hmm. it, even though like, even mm -hmm. though my family is like, you know, this is not what we do because this has historically not been how we made a living. Mm -hmm. We made a living by getting a job and and getting a paycheck like this thing that you're trying to do is not the way. Yeah. And, um, and given, you know, when I came into the world of writing in the 90s that we had um, mentors um, who so many have passed to the next place, mm -hmm. you know, Virginia Hamilton is gone, Arnold Adolph is gone, Jerry Pickney is gone, mm -hmm. Floyd Cooper, like so many people who, um, who, who Walter D. Myers who began this journey for me um, make me know that part of my success too is that I'm still here telling mm -hmm. the story because mm -hmm. the truth is um, folks of color don't live as long as white folks for the most part because of racism, because of you know the, um, the <clears throat> gap in income, all the ways in which life is harder because of microaggressions, mm -hmm. um, the everyday weathering. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so for me, to the act of survival and writing in that inside of that, it feels successful. So, and I do think that that love of the word has um, uh, that love of storytelling and that love of my people mm -hmm. has is the, is the reason that I'm um, able to sit down every day and say, you know, I want to keep doing this because I love my people <laughs> and I love writing and. And now I'm at this place where I could do it all, and, and people yeah. give me awards for it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And I'll say, and this, is, this isn't a question, but when you were speaking, I, I started thinking, Jackie, of how much of a mentor you've been, right? And, and I think when you were speaking, how you brought ancestors into the rooms, elders into the room, I, I've been, I am a better literary citizen because of how you um, engage with me, and I think I am able to engage with writers um, of a, who are a bit younger because I'm like, Jackie was just too generous. <laughs> like, I, I have no option but to do so, right? And I think that, that that is part of the legacy of what we do in these communities where we are fighting back mm -hmm. is um, we have to also say, this is the lesson I learned, and I'll pass this tool so that you too Right, can carry on, and so. Um, can you tell the story about when um, was it Angie Thomas? Who, who whose book did you um, inspire? I thought you inspired. Um, never mind. Me? Oh, oh, no, 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 no! You're <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 oh goodness! <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when I was, I have an amazing, amazing teacher who's also really good friends with Jackie, named Phil Bildner. Um, he's also an author. Um, writes middle grade and YA, and he was my sixth and eighth grade language arts teacher. Um, he was not an author yet. He was writing and, and partnered with an editor, and so the book world was huge. I was a little tiguerita from Manhattan who like <laughs> loved books, but was also really, um, I don't know, I was, I was spunky. And Phil just like had a way to be like, I'm gonna put the books in your hands that you need. And he would get arcs, right? Advanced reader copies. So I remember there was one year he got this book by Angela Johnson um, called Heaven, which I adored, right? It's the story of this, um, this teenage boy, or this, this young woman who's discovering that her parents are not her biological parents. And she goes on this journey to try to figure out what that means. And her best friend is named Bobby, and he has a child. And I had never read about a teen father, right? I read about teen parents or like young women who were pregnant, but never a teen father. And I'm like, hold on, where Bobby from? How did this baby get here? What's happening? <laughs> And so I'm asking Phil all these questions. Are you my teacher? What's up? And he looks at me, he's like, you know, write her a letter and I'll make sure she gets it. 
And I'm like, bet, right? So I write this long <laughs> four page letter, like, Miss Angela Johnson, I got questions, <laughs> right? And I, you know, Phil sends it off. I never hear back, right? And, but two years later, a novel is published called The First Part Last. And it is Angela Johnson's um, prequel to Heaven, right? Which answers the questions of Bobby's life. And when you look at the dedication page, she dedicated it to Elizabeth Acevedo and the rest of the students of her sixth grade class. And it was my first time ever seeing my name in print. And I was like, oh, I like that, right? <laughs> But that's a way that this was someone who I think was also almost mentoring from afar, who was like, those were good ideas. And now I know how books work. I'm like, oh, she had this joint in the tuck already, right? <laughs> but but, I, but I, I think there's something powerful there about the just generosity of um, how we are in community with each other and responding and this exchange of story, right? That, that, that has something. And my first book, when I was dedicating, I was like, oh, it has to go to one of my students in that middle school. And so it, you know, I think it continues in that way. Thanks for letting me have a little moment. Yeah, I appreciate it. <laughs> I want to talk about fighting back, and I want to start with you, Hannah, um, all the fighting parts. So all the fighting parts takes a very nuanced look at how the ability to fight looks like so many different things. It can mean speaking up and speaking out, but it can also simply be surviving and be able to move towards the future. The story also touches on how healing is a form of fighting as well, especially considering how the story ultimately follows Amina down a path where she's naming her abuser publicly, legally holding him to account. How are you able to balance and make space for those expansive definitions of fighting back? I came forward my senior year of high school, um, and I came forward because I knew I was going off to university out of state, and I was like, well, I'm about to dip, so yeah. I'm like, this is, this is a good time, if, if any. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but my journey, I, I guess my journey with like the court system was eight years long. Um, people don't wow. know that part. I got the deal for fighting parts before I had a verdict, wow. <laughs> um, which, is, which actually I think influenced um, how that that wow. ended, that's a whole, I'm very, I'm very grateful for the book is what I have yes. to say. Um, but I am like the queen of being like very, very hard on myself. I was so hard about, like even like in my witness statements, I was like, oh, I said this like this, they're not gonna believe me because I said it like that. Mm. And like, I, you know, like all these things. And I think for a long time, I did not think that I was a fighter. Um, I felt like, um, I felt just very, very small. Um, especially in such like a legal, a big legal system. Um, and I felt very, very silenced by like my church community because that was a community I had my whole life. Mm -hmm. um, and so losing that community was definitely hard and I just felt like I did not know how to fight. Um, and it wasn't until I wrote, and I'm, I'm so grateful for even being able to write the book, like getting it published I think is like the icing on the cake, like being honored in this kind of way is like lovely, but for me like the biggest accomplishment is knowing that I finished that first draft because I didn't think that I would get to a place where I would get to name some of these things. The first draft was, um, the first uh, title for the book was actually Call Him By Name. So like when you talk about like naming yeah. Yeah. something, I'm yeah. like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. There were a lot of times in that process when I wanted to drop or mm -hmm. um, just not be a part of that process mm -hmm. at all. And one day I thought about the fact that, and this was while I was awaiting a, a trial, I thought about the fact that even if, I, even if I did drop, right, that doesn't change the fact that I was able to name these yes. things. And when you're waiting eight years, let me tell you, like dropping, it's very easy. Mm. Like I, I done cursed out prosecutors. <laughs> like you get to a point where you're just like, which I apologize for, that wasn't a good thing. That was a good thing for me to do. Um, but you just get so fed up and I, I just got to the point where I just recognized that I am a fighter because I survived that event. Mm -hmm. And not only did I survive that event, but it doesn't define me, mm -hmm. right? Like it's a, it's a huge part of who I am, it's a huge part of what I write about, um, but I am so much more than that. Mm -hmm. And I am a fighter because I knew how to carry on. Right, and I had to learn how to carry on because I didn't yeah. for a long time. Yeah, so when I think of like the title and like the idea of fighting back, like, uh, like it's not the fact that I was able to like, you know, get through that whole process. Is the fight? Is the fact that I survived? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And there's a character in fighting parts that I don't talk about often, 
Um, but her journey is very, very different than my main characters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was important for me to include that because that's fighting too. Yes. It yeah, just didn't yes. look the way that Amina's journey did. Mm -hmm. Jamila, can I ask you about Grounded? It's um, such a fascinating setting. We have four authors. We have this incredible main character. How does this story come together? Uh, how did you all come up with the idea? And the fact that it was written during the pandemic, right? And so what did that influence at all how you're responding? That was a lot of questions, so you just yes. do what you want. <laughs> but, um... I have an answer for all of them too. Yes. Uh, but I'll probably lose track of at least one of Okay, them. I got you, I'll come back. When I start talking about Grande, I have to first give credit, a lot of credit to Aisha Saeed. Yes. Mm. Aisha Saeed, Aisha Saeed. Like, mm. So, um, because that was her original idea, right? Mm. She started with a, a bud of an idea, right? Um, you know, just a seed, right? And she started with this idea, you know, just I think she was in an airport one day and, and just imagined kids being stuck in an airport and, and, and what could happen. Um, and said, oh, I want to do a book about this. And she's, you know, hugely successful author, obviously, and she could have just said, you know what, I'm just gonna write that. Yeah. And, but she felt that she wanted to have representation of different Muslim voices, and we have an increase of Muslim voices in the, the literary space, but it's not a lot, right? And there is kind of a, even now what we have is sort of, it's concentrated, it's a certain type of Muslim voice, for the most part, that's getting a lot of representation, and others are just not. And we have a lot of diversity within our diversity, mm -hmm. right? And so it then became, but I want to have other Muslim voices yes. to kind of show who would actually Ooh. show up, because the story you know, starts at the end of a Muslim conference, right? Who would actually show up? What kinds of kids are actually going to these conferences and coming back from these different communities? Black Muslims, you know, Arab American, Shia Muslim, you know, um, people who are, you know, third culture Muslims, you know, expats, those kinds of mm -hmm. people who are in these, you know, who are going to these kinds of um, conferences. And so it started with that seed of, you know, trying to bring people together and then we came together. And I think, you know, she gave us um, each of us, so Huda and SK Ali and myself, you know, kind of we had like a sentence like of a character, like, you know, th this is what we think, kind of a character who this is what they're going through. Make this into a character, right? And so we then took it and we took from our communities and sort of put together what would make sense, you know, who we saw in our communities. And so that's kind of how we pulled it together. And um, then it did, and, 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 and formed a story from there. And it was a lot of conversation, a lot of talking. Um, the pandemic, I think we were feeling that antsiness of wanting to be, get in a plane and go somewhere, mm -hmm. right? And feeling yeah. grounded, right? Yeah, so we yeah. were writing and yeah. we were communicating and we were getting very good at Zoom around that time. <laughs> and we were meeting like yeah. every couple weeks, you know, on Zoom to talk out this, because that's the only way we could do it. Um, and, and so that it impacted our, our storytelling, but it was all about, you know, kind of that feeling of wanting us to escape and being grounded somewhere, being stranded somewhere. I, it made me think of when I used to do slam and we would have group poems, and I'm just like, somebody has the idea, but all four of you get on stage, right, and you, you add your own sasong, and so I love that. Uh -huh. Ari, do you want a craft question, or do you want like a more? <laughs> Whatever you want. Okay, we're gonna go with the more. Um, you mentioned that some of the Breebe stories included in the book have never been translated in English before. What did it mean to you to, um, put English language to some of those stories? Was there anything you had to navigate as you chose this one, yes, this one I keep, or this one we keep, or what, what was that? And is there something you hoped readers would get from some of those stories, or were you like, nah, this is for us? Uh, kind of both, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, um, I think that for me, growing up as like, you know, like I said, there's very few breweries in the US. Um, so when I, I, you know, if I got the chance to go back to my territory, that's when I could learn. But even then, I, I was struggling even to have Spanish. So, because mm -hmm. it's like three levels of colonization with my people, right? We're in Costa Rica, but it's contemporary Costa Rica. Before it was Costa Rica, which is named for rich coast, right? That's a colonizer name, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. oh, there's some rich things there. Yeah. Um, before that, there's, you know, more, like, now there's about eight tribes, but there was more than that, too. Um, so, there's layers of colonization that we had to go to, but we still have our territory, our language, our stories, which we feel really honored by. Um, but so it, it, to me, you know, there was these, all these layers that kept me um, 
So I'm really connecting. And for Native people, story is a, a big way we've survived. It's a big, um, there's been research done. I, I love this podcast, All, All My Relations. Um, and they talk about how um, if Native kids, teenagers know their creation stories or their stories, um, uh, they're less likely to self-harm. Mm. And which is a, a, a difficult thing we deal with in, in Native mm. community. Multiple people in my family have committed suicide. We, we have, this is just a hard part of our history and our current contemporary life. So our stories heal, right? Um, and so it was really important to me to have archive in the book mm. um, for my brother, for my children, for the future of um, the diaspora. <laughs> um, uh, to have those things um, as a lifeline, but then also as hopefully a, a way to make the story bigger than mine. Yeah. Because um, the book isn't just mine, right? Now it belongs to my ancestors because mm. their stories are in it too. Yeah. Um, and so that's, the, yeah, it, it feels really special and kind of sacred in that way and beyond, beyond me to be able to have gotten to do that translation with my mentor. Um, and then, and then have it be part of the book. Um, and it really magnified the themes that were going on mm. with it. Um, often when I do school visits, I, I talk about one of them. Um, and it's so cool because folklore allows us to like understand so much about our lives, right? Like yeah. I even used folklore like classic, like killing this, like the dragon, right? Like we yeah. all kind of had a feel for that, right? Mm -hmm. Because they give us truth, they give us insight on something. Um, and so, and it's kind of a, a beautiful way to have the specific reach the universal. So our folklore yeah. is kind of what, it, how does um, Zora Neale Hurston say? She calls it the boiled down pot liquor of Ooh. society. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's um, that's really what folklore is. And so it's really important for me to be able to include those stories. Um, and, and really, yeah, I guess kind of cheating, right? Because it's my ancestor <laughs> stories. I'm like, they're in there too, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's a good question though, I love I it. Love it. <laughs> Jackie, your story takes place in the neighborhood nicknamed The Matchbox, which you mentioned in your author's note is somewhere that you grew up yourself. Mm -hmm. Why did that neighborhood and that time period feel like the right backdrop for this coming of age story? The neighborhood is Bushwick. I don't know how many people know the Bushwick section of Brooklyn, um, but it started out, um, predominantly Irish and German. Um, then um, white flight happened, um, black and Latinx people moved in. Um, and then the houses started mysteriously catching on fire because a lot of the people moving in were renters. It turned out the landlords were setting a lot of the fires to get insurance. And, um, um, and yes, it was the neighborhood I grew up in. And a lot of the houses were wood framed. And I was talking to my friend Toshi about this, not my daughter, my bestie. Um, and one of the things that happened is Bushwick now is this kind of um, more expensive, quote unquote, mm -hmm. artist, hipster neighborhood. And when I was writing Another Brooklyn, I wrote that because people kept talking about discovering Bushwick. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that gentrification that happens when people think they found a place that, and it's now theirs, mm -hmm. and erase the people who came before. Um, in this case, the blacks, the Latinos, the you know, German, the Irish, the Lenape, like the people whose neighborhood it was, that erases the history of it too, right? If people believe long enough, or for how many generations, that this is who this neighborhood belongs to. Um, so when I was growing up in that neighborhood, there weren't a lot of trees. The city came in and planted trees. And now the streets are these beautiful tree-lined yep. trees. Yes. Yep. Um, so when I tell people I grew up in the hood, they're like, no, you didn't. Mm -hmm. I've been to mm -hmm. Bushwick. Mm -hmm. I know that. It's like, no, it's a different Bushwick. <laughs> but in my mind, I thought it was important to know about the destruction of that neighborhood through fires because the same kind of destruction is happening through building. Yes. Um, so all over New York City, we have uh, so many people who are unhoused, mm -hmm. and yet we have these, what are called ghost buildings, or ghost apartments where they've built these really expensive high rises that no one can live in, um, except very, very wealthy people. And then we have the unhoused people, and that's the same kind of destruction because it becomes an unhousing of people and a yes. displacing of people. Yes. Um, so it, if we look back at the 70s where um, the Matchbox where Remember Us takes place, we can look at what's happening you know, in DC and Brooklyn and Manhattan, you know, all over the country and see that um, similarity. And I, I think that, that, again, it's important to do. It's important to know 
that we don't have to recreate the wheel when we're thinking about social, ju social justice right. and, and how to create change and how to speak out against something, we can look to the past for the tools. So I'd like to invite um, our student attendees to come up if there were any questions that you all thought of that you'd have for our panelists. I was wondering, when you write your books, uh, what is usually your inspiration for writing them? Does it come from past experiences or like problems you see? Totally. I, I, experiences, personal experiences, are so much a part of what I write. Um, and it's and, and but it's fiction, so it's you get to you get to change things as you want, right? Or you get to modify them or make them work in a narrative and a story. Um, so yeah, I think it's definitely for me. As so far, they've been a lot of personal experiences, um, especially for my first book. Um, but now, as I'm working on other things, now I'm finding inspiration from other things, like bigger issues, like you said, problems that I'm seeing in the world. My next one's a murder mystery about a land activist, Ooh. right? Because um, right? it's a different stakes now, different uh, issues that I get to think about. Um, but yeah, so I think the first one, definitely personal, but also, yeah, like it gets to move out a little bit after that, too. I would say personal experience as well, but also anger. I'm real angry <laughs> about a lot of things. <laughs> you write clapback books. Yeah, I, write clap back back. I like that. Oh I like that. I might have to. <laughs> it's yours. It's on your Thank card. You. <laughs> I like that, though. I write, I guess, like clapback books, things that make me really, really angry. I like to write about things that make me mad, mad, things that make me really mad. Um, but that's my way of being able to address them um, in a way that is uh, safe. Yeah. too, right? And hopefully in a way that will help other folks out when they're reading my work too. Same thing. I mean, I, it's, it's really personal experience. Not, not the same thing like I write angry books necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I just feel like as a, as a human being, as a, as a mom, as, a, as someone who's taught um, kids in school, like there's always some, there are, there are so many sources of inspiration, like real people just are sources, right? And I, so I have a personal connection to everything I've written. Like if I, if, if you ask me the background of any book that, you know, my characters, I can tell you how I'm personally connected to mm -hmm. that character, whether it's me or it's someone I know. But I think people just always give inspiration or constantly give inspiration for stories. Mm -hmm. I agree. I always say, mm -hmm. talk about a teacher, uh, you know, who told me. Mm -hmm that if you survive kindergarten, you have enough to write about for the rest of your life. Yes. <laughs> okay. And I think, I think it's so true. We have so yeah. many experiences yeah. that are our own other people's stuff we read, stuff we see, stuff we think about, and all of that informs it. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is from Ms. Woodson. Um, so, a uh, little spoiler, in the book, uh, Sage um, really dives into how the fire affects her when she almost sets her house on fire. How did looking into that exploration of how outward events affect yourself, like how did that, writing about that, affect you? Ooh. Oh, that's such a great so question. Much. I mean, not like the other one wasn't great, or not like all the questions haven't been great. Um, and not because that was just specifically for me. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was here like, ooh, take my job. That was good. I, I think we talked about it a little bit on the panel too. That um, that how um, stuff that happens out seemingly outside of your experience has a deep impact on you and can somehow sometimes cause you to come somehow lead to your own self destruction. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing about setting fires is there's this sense of control, right? I have control. I can put it out whenever I want. I have control. Um, you know, I can. Um, I can burn this place down, but also um, it was that she was at a very angry place at that time. And I think the thing about fire is there is this connection to fire and rage, right? She was burning mad, like, mm -hmm. and so I really wanted to show the impact of the matchbox and the impact of the fire that was inside of her, right? The end of that fire that doesn't get killed inside of her mm -hmm. when she's bullied by the guy who, you know, questions her gender and ability and everything. Um, but I, I really wanted to just look at the impact of how destruction can make us self-destructive. I love this book. Thank you. And I'm really excited now to read all of your other books, too. Um, but my question was, how um, much of you 
any, any of you who want to answer, do you put into your books, whether like consciously or not, or after the fact, do you reflect and find, oh, maybe I put more myself into this character or not? Like how much of you do you put into your characters? Mm. I put a lot of myself into them. I mean, I'm not going, I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> yeah. um, not, not, I'm not saying we're the same person because some people do think it's an autobiography. I would call it autofiction. Mm -hmm. I think that's a better word for it. I found myself in the beginning trying to make her so different from me because I was like, oh, I want people to think I'm a real fiction writer. Mm -hmm. Like if she's too similar to people, people won't take yeah. me seriously. Mm -hmm. And then I think I found like a happy medium. Like I didn't want to make her not angry just because I was angry in real life, right? Um, I didn't want to not make her like me just for the purpose of saying, well, she's not like me, so I'm a real writer. Mm -hmm. um, but then there are things about her that are also very different from me. Um, I think she's cooler than me. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, I would say I, I would say a, a good amount of myself is in Amina, um, but there are some some healthy differences. Too. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Hello. By the way, this lineup is beautiful, oh. and I'm um, so grateful to be here. I'm shaking right now. Um, <laughs> anyway, I, um, I just want to say, well, I have a question, and it's that: How do you find? your voice in a space where so many concepts are recycled? <laughs> That's an amazing question. <laughs> That's actually something we have to keep thinking about. <laughs> yeah. Something, um, something I did, uh, one thing I did decide um, a while back is actually to write for the young girl that was me mm -hmm. and to always start with her. Mm -hmm. yes. So first yes. I started writing for my sons and that was a big deal. And then I realized after a while, it was actually, it was actually more selfish. I actually wanted more for, for that little girl who couldn't find herself in books. And I think when I start with her first, what is the book that she wanted to read, mm -hmm. right? What is the book that she wants? Then that's when I can, you know, later, that's when I can find my unique voice. So that's yeah. where, where I start first, you know, I think. But I'm still going to think about that question because that is actually something I think authors should always think about. I think stop engaging with those recycled content, you know, yeah. the recycled content. Like if you pick up a book and it feels like something you've read before or it feels cliched or something, you don't have to engage with it. And, you know, the same with social media. Like I, I think social media can be very destructive because you kind of see a lot of the same things yeah. over and over. Yes. And because it's just bits of it, it doesn't always inform the deeper dive into a narrative. And so I say, um, you know when you find that book that speaks to you. And, and that's the one you read again and again because you're trying to get to that. And I totally agree about going back, writing, remembering the, the child you were. You guys are amazing because you really put out things that need to be talked about that are so important that people so, don't seem to grasp that like, these are so serious issues, and then they just forget about it. They're like, oh, well, yeah, this is an important thing. We need to work on it. And then nothing happens. They don't, it just makes me so upset that no one acts so important, because it's such a big thing with all these issues. I'm not even going to start naming them, because there's so many. Mm -hmm. But we take it for granted, because we really need to like actually act. So how can a person like me, who's not really that great at acting on things, or is not really listened to, how can I share my voice better because it's so hard for me to do that because of how much I'm put down by how other people treat it as if it's not serious. That is a really great question. Yeah, I commend you for yeah. the, the bravery of asking about action mm -hmm. and the way that these books can inspire folks to action and then they choose non-action and I think that, that, that that's an amazing first step. I'm giving them a time to think. Um, so thank you for like <laughs> even putting language to how do books make us want to do things and how do I now do the things, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Liz, you can answer it too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> These questions are too good. I'm sitting here like, ooh, tell me. I think even the fact that you're saying like you, I, I forgot the language you used, but something to the extent of like feeling like you speak out about those things and feeling like you get turned down. A lot of people don't even get to the phase where they get turned down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I feel like you need to give like, give yourself props for being there, mm -hmm. right? Because I think that's half of the battle. And I, I, like, you don't seem like someone who wants to stop talking about these things and engaging <laughs> with these things. Yeah. So I don't think you're going to. Yeah. I know what it's like to feel like you're constantly screaming about things that are important to you and feel like you're talking to a wall. But 
my most earnest piece of advice is to keep screaming about them. <laughs> Um, because people are listening. We're listening. Yeah. yeah. Right? Thank you. And I'll bounce off Hannah real quick and just say, like, there are literal corporations whose entire job and every muscle they have goes to gaining attention. It is the number one thing that everyone wants because it means, it means profit, it means eyes, mm -hmm. it means this, that, and the third. So anytime that you say, what if we pay attention here, right? You are refocusing and you are literally fighting back against huge mm -hmm. advertising companies, marketing companies, like all the things. Mm -hmm. And so that little what if, let's refocus, can I ask, mm -hmm. like that matters because it's disruptive. Mm -hmm. And it may not feel like this huge action because you're going against machines. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But every time that each one of us says, let's refocus, let's look here, let's not forget, it may feel like it's the void, but those little bits and pieces, all of us doing that at the same time, that's big, right? And so I would just kind of say keep, you know, um, keep amplifying, keep doing that, and also be really mindful of protecting yourself yeah. and your energy. Yeah. Because yes. it can be easy to just become mm -hmm. a, like a screaming person and not realize, oh, I'm, I'm tapped out. Mm -hmm. And so it's okay to also take a break sometimes and say, I'm gonna replenish, and now we're back. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. That's very nice. I was thinking about that. I was um, um, in conversation with Morgan Parker, who's an amazing yes, poet, yes. SAS, um, fiction mm -hmm. writer. And she was saying, one thing she was saying was um, what helped her get her book on the page was therapy, lots mm -hmm. of therapy. And she said, writing is not therapy. You know, writing is therapeutic, but it's not therapy. Yes, yes, yes. And yes. I do think what you were saying about the corporations, um, People are intent on us not yes. being our best selves yes. and not showing up 100% because yep. when we don't show up 100%, you know, we binge buy, right? Yes. You know, yes. we do things that get us in prison. Then we have the prison industrial complex. Like all yes. of this stuff happens. So take care of those mentals. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I first want to say that I am completely starstruck right now. I can't believe that I'm in front of these incredible, successful women. And I just want to thank you for enlightening me as a reader and um, bringing diversity and books. And I'm just really grateful to all of you for that. And so um, my last question was for Hannah. But before that, Elizabeth Acevedo, um, your poem Afro-Latina inspired me incredibly because um, I come from Bolivia and I moved here so... at a young age. And the transition was very hard for me. And I felt myself losing my voice in what America is and kind of felt myself wanting to go into the background. And when I read your poem, it spoke so much to me and I'm just really grateful for that. And so Hannah, um, I have a question about your book. Is it okay if I call you Hannah? Sorry, I should have said Miss. No, <laughs> <laughs> you can call me Hannah. You can even call me Hannah. Okay, okay. So in your book, um, I was reading and I saw the relationship between um, Amina and her father, and it was kind of like he was there, but he was very distant, almost yeah. like um, very, a very deep silence in their relationship. So I'm just wondering why you put that in the book. Whew, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I know for a fact my father would be okay with me talking about this because we've had these conversations before this book came out. My dad is not the dad in fighting parts, <laughs> but there are some similarities. I think my dad supported me a lot more then it, it, I'll say a lot sooner mm -hmm. than Amina's dad did. Mm -hmm. um, but me and my dad did not have a really, really great relationship when I was growing up. And I even tell my dad, like my dad is the reason that I think people can change and grow mm -hmm. because me and my dad are like this. I was talking to Ari, like <laughs> my phone rang last night and she was like, are you gonna get this? And I was like, oh, it's just my dad who calls me every single day. Uh. <laughs> like, <laughs> like making up for missed time almost. Yeah. Um, but now we're super tight. And I, I wanted to include that relationship um, because I think it's very, very nuanced. There are a lot of readers who don't like Amina's dad. I think it's fair. I think it's fair. Um, but I always say, like, if I could write um, five years into the future, I think Amina and her dad would be really, really tight. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to show that nuanced relationship, and I wanted to show that growing relationship. I was wondering, how do you sort of give your characters such, like, voice? Sort of, I don't know how to describe it, but, like, that's a good way. Ooh, that's a great question. A good... I think sometimes for me, it's listening to other voices, mm. it, and maybe not listening to the ones that everybody is is, is, is recycling, mm -hmm. right? The ones that are closer to you, mm -hmm. the ones that speak to you, mm -hmm. um, because they're they're showing you something about yourself. Um, and then from there, I think it can it can it, it almost tunes your ear yeah. to your own yeah. voice. 
Yeah. Um, and from there, then, I think it, it often is, is useful. So leaning on yeah. your ancestors, people that came before yeah. you, your elders, and then yes. really allowing them to, yeah. to guide you and also show you who you are and, or who your character is. <laughs> yeah. I'm just here to retweet, right? Like <laughs> that. No, that that language about tuning feels so precise there because it's. Uh, there are readers that I read and I'm like, oh, they have. I mean, authors they have a good ear. Mm -hmm. They're paying attention to dialogue. They are listening to how things are said. You see the syntax on the page. And you're like, oh, that's not grammatical, but it's, mm -hmm. but it, but it sounds right. Yeah, and so I think the more that you pay attention to what sounds right, and that you're listening to ancestors and what are the voices that we haven't seen, like you sharpen. Wow, so <laughs> my question is about when, specifically for Saints of the Household and then all of your books, like Remember Us and Another Brooklyn, that book's amazing, oh my God, I love it so much. But when you're writing about your communities and people in your life, how do you take inspiration when developing characters? How do you take inspiration without just copy and pasting mm. a person mm. into your book. I'll talk about the character Nicole in my book, who's an Anishinaabe character, an Ojibwe character. Um, I co-wrote her with my cousins who are Anishinaabe. And I said, let's create this character Nicole. So we met multiple times and we talked about her. We created her hairstyle, her glasses. Um, because I'm not Anishinaabe, so I can't, I can't fully create her, right? I'm an author, I'm a writer, I can do the writing part, um, but, I, but I, I needed them and their voices. And so that really helped me with, and, and to, to also think about, uh, yeah, how much I don't know and then what are the ways that I can navigate that? Um, mm. And those tools of reaching out and co-creating was super, really, really great about, uh, about creating that character, Nicole. And some people, they're like, read Saints and that's their favorite character. And I go, oh, she came up in a later draft. Oh, like, yeah. Homegirl was not there the first draft. Um, <laughs> she came out with edits, you know? Um, and so uh, it, it's really, uh, that's, I, I, love, I love that question about, about creating characters. I think my characters, you know, you, you can't really cut and paste from real life completely and make a character because characters are bigger mm. than real life. Yeah. Uh, even though they don't seem so on the page, when you take them off the page, like that person that's walking in that book is seven feet tall, mm. you know, and then they've been shrunk down to be put in that book. I, uh, I always think about people I want to be friends with because I'm going to mm. spend a lot of time mm. with them. Right? <laughs> yeah. um, and then, um, and then yeah. I think of who I'd love to be, like I would love to have been a basketball player, right? Mm -hmm. I would love to have been an anthropologist or, you mm -hmm. know, or studying something I was really interested in like that. Um, you know, my editor, Nancy, helps me ask, your editors ask you questions that mm -hmm. get you deeper into your character. With a character like Freddie, you know, I love, he's one of my favorite characters in Remember Us, and it was just like, if I, you know, who is the kid I'd wanna spend a lot of time with? And, um, <laughs> And what makes them special? And then the other question that we all, I, I think we all ask is the, the um, hero's journey. What does your character mm -hmm. want and how are they going to get it? Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. the narrative, right? Because yeah. each of your, all the characters in the books want something. Yes. yes. My name is Troy. I attend Brooklyn Middle School as an eighth grader. Um, my question is, how do you guys feel when you write? Like, mm -hmm. What's that feeling you get when you're writing your last page or your first page? Yeah. <laughs> Those are my two favorite pages. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Okay. Yeah, don't ask about the middle. That's my answer. It feels really good to write the first and the last page. <laughs> I think the first page feels a little scary. But then the last page is like, oh, I did that. Yeah. <laughs> and even if it's not good, like even if it's an early draft, it's like, oh, I finished it. Like the end, like the story is at least mostly there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah if figuring out the ending is like, I don't know. I just I, I remember yeah. finishing the ending of my second book, and I like, I just was like existing, and like I was like, I gotta let me tell my husband about it. Like I gotta <laughs> tell him. Like and, and it, it, yeah, there's there's something really spectacular about ending the book. But I, my favorite is beginning. Um, I don't know why. I just I love I love the start of the book. That's when I enjoy it. But figuring out the ending, it's like all the hard work that got you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This might sound too extra, but I will say that one of the reasons I think I'm a compulsive writer is because there's nothing that feels quite as transcendent. Mm -hmm. Like I rise above myself, and I'm like, wait, did I do that? Like how? how? Like I, how yes. did I make? 
<laughs> you know, I made a person, I made yeah. a thing. I figured out a problem I didn't know a week ago how I was gonna figure yeah. out, and now yeah. I'm at the end, and I did that? Yeah. <laughs> and I think yeah. it goes back, right, to what Ari was saying of like, oh no, my ancestors did yeah. that, I'm channeling, I was listening, and you just realize like, oh, I'm in tune, right? <laughs> and there's yeah. something in you that just like knows like, oh, I'm, I did this alone and I did not do this alone. And that feeling to me is, um, it's like something I try to arrive at again and again because it's so hard to find. So, uh, it's true, and that's why when people ask, well, how did you write it? We can't say, it's right? Just, so yeah. we can lie and say what we did. Oh, crap. But and, uh, we don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Like, I read the so books. Much unknown. Yeah, yeah. 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 We're yeah. pulling. Yeah. Hi, my name is Armani Gordon. I'm an eighth grader attending Brooklyn Middle School. Hi, Armani. My question is for Miss Woodson. In your book, what was the message you were trying to send out? Because everybody can read your book and perceive it in a different way. What was the message you were trying to send out while creating this book? I love the way you present the book. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, whatever message you got. Yeah. I know um, people will say this is what was the author's intention or that was the author's intention. I think I, you know, I never know what a book is about because mm -hmm. uh, books are about so many things. Mm -hmm. But I know it was. I know what it was trying to say. It was trying to say we have a right to be here and we have a right to be safe. And that's yeah. what all of my books try to say. Yeah. So, and you know, Sage in the end realizes that and she finds her people and mm. she feels safe and she gets to play ball. I was wondering uh, if you felt, well, if any of y'all felt prepared for your next generation of readers because of how society is right now. Like, is there anything different or not challenging? But because it, it's a different perspective, so there's gonna many different more stories. So, like, are you prepared? Well, I'm looking forward to reading your all, all your stories. Yeah. Oh, I don't know if that was like yeah. that. <laughs> no. I, I think it also goes back to listening, right? Like, I think as a writer, you have to be tapped in. You have to yeah, know what what are the concerns, what's interesting, and then you have to remember that like some ideas have longevity beyond, mm -hmm. right? Just because the next generation might move differently, dress differently, talk differently, that doesn't mean that some of the same things that persist, um, the things that hurt us, hurt us, right? The things mm -hmm. that make us feel loved, make us feel loved, and I think those messages we're passing down mm -hmm. from beyond, right? And so that that's where you hone in, and then you also just gotta know language. Like, all right, what are the kids saying? How are they saying it? Who are we listening to? What are we eating? Right, like you just have to be open to the fact that like you don't know everything. Hi, um, it's crazy to be here. You all are amazing. Elizabeth Acevedo, I read The Poet X three times and I cried every single time. Oh. Um, I wanted to ask, so I know that a big part of being a great writer is being a great reader. Mm. Um, and so I wanted to ask, uh, what pieces of literature, poetry, or short stories, or just full novels, um, impacted the way that you write? Uh, I love the poet Joy Harsha. I'm sorry, I threw out Disney. I was going to give a list. I was like, yes, this was Yeah, yes. Joy Harsha. Well, poets of my, I'll go poets. Uh, Lucille Clifton, yes. um, Joy Harsha, um, yeah, and authors, or Zora Neale Hurston, like the, like the elders, and then also like, yeah, like contemporary voices. Um, some of them are up here, <laughs> uh, which is wild. Um, yeah, or, yeah, yeah, like Brown Girl Dreaming. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's one of mine. Um, but Dang. rapid fire for other folks. Did I steal people from you? You did. I'm sorry. No, but I feel like we have similar taste. <laughs> we do, too. we do. Um, I'm gonna add to that, Maya Angelou when I was in high oh, school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Obsessed. Oh, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, Tiffany D. Jackson. Mm -hmm. um, man, the uh, literally the poet X. Yeah. Um, you go now. No, that's okay. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, but I mean, I was going to mention uh, Maya Angelou as well, just because. And I was just joking, saying you stole my answer. No, <laughs> you, know, you can say. But um, I just when I think about myself becoming, coming into my womanhood and in, in, in high school, Maya Angelou, yeah. um, I, I had to discover her yeah. um, to be who I am. Um, but also, I mean, definitely, <laughs> the go. I mean, and when I think about those the, those years and like you yeah. know reading, especially like things like Showway, and yeah. that really you know having to read that book again and again, and, and you know to my sons and to my, for myself, you know books like that that just kind of helped me to feel discover 
possibilities for, for children's book writing. You know. mm -hmm. Hi, Hi. Miss, uh, this is for Miss Anna. Um, first of all, I'm from Sierra Leone. Hey! So. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you. you. Yeah, the first time I read your book, and I was like, "Oh, this is my story." Wow. <laughs> Woo, I keep forgetting where this is the here. like the community service, the church, and yeah. stuff. So my question is like, what what piece of advice you would give a teenager that like that is scared to sp to speak out, mm -hmm. but expect her parents to to react of their action to like notice their action. Whew. That's a really good question. My first piece of advice um, would honestly be to consider safety. Yes. Um, I wish as a young person that I knew that I would have gotten the support that I got from my family, but that was something that I thought of for quite some time. I, I would consider safety. And I would consider actually writing a letter um, because I wrote a letter to my dad before I spoke to my dad. And that was very, very helpful for me, um, especially because I was able to organize my thoughts. And I think there's something that's very honest about a letter too. Um, do you have siblings? Yeah. I would talk to my siblings first. Do you have older siblings? Yeah. Older yeah. siblings? I would talk to my siblings first, <laughs> for sure, and have them help you navigate that because they've known your parents longer than you do. Like some, they will not take you serious. And that's true, too. Yeah. My sisters are 10 and 7 years older than me, so I get that. Yeah. They, they feel like they're my parent sometimes. Yeah. Um, that, that's the advice I would give. Um, I think start with a letter and talk to those siblings. Get the tea. Yeah. <laughs> Thank Great you. Question. Hello, my name is Alicia Mitchell. I'm also from Brooklyn Middle School. I'm a seventh grader. My question is, would y'all make one of y'all books into a movie, and how would y'all feel if that came true? Movie dreams. Oh. I actually well, wrote um, the screenplay for Red at the Bone, one of my adult books. Um, yeah, and <laughs> it, was, it was my pandemic project because um, I wanted to, I, you know, I was having a hard time writing, but I wanted to keep writing. I was having a hard time writing novels, so I was trying to write something. And we're starting um, to shoot later in the <gasps> summer, Cynthia Revo. Okay. So, um, and hopefully it'll be out you know, once we finish shooting, once we start shooting. But, um, but it was, it, it's an, I think it's really hard when someone else visualizes your book, so I think I had to do it myself. Yeah, yeah. One of my books, Clap When You Land, um, I wrote the pilot, and I, I think it's similar to what Jackie said. It's just like, the, the amazing thing is that so many people have access to it who may not have had access to the book or mm -hmm. don't know about the book. The scary thing is that you really give the project to a lot of other creatives because television and film has many, 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 many more hands. And so you gotta kind of be okay with like, I can't control how this is now going to be depicted. So you, you win some and you lose some, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a process. My question is for Ms. Tyson. Uh, why did you write your book in a poetry-like way? poetry part came because uh, Max, that character, is a painter. And painting is uh, kind of the most abstract. It's like, you know, it, it's, it's like this like this thing we don't always have language for. Mm -hmm. And I think that poetry tries to capture that most mm -hmm. out of creative writing. It's mm -hmm. trying, trying to capture that abstract, yeah. that big, that, that like yeah. gooeyness. Mm -hmm. um, and so I felt like those two needed to be together. Thank you for that question. Hi, my name is Sophia, and I just think all of you guys are so gorgeous in the outfits. Like, <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> and so I wanted to ask Ms. Jacqueline, so earlier in the interview, you said that you love white people, which, me too, but um, I wanted to ask, who's your favorite white person and why? Uh, <laughs> what? Who's your favorite who? Totally white person. Person. Uh, no. you don't love my them. favorite white person? Yes. <laughs> my children, I like them all the same. <laughs> that is wild. Who's your favorite? My best friend. Oh, I love that. Hi, so you guys were talking about um, how there's been lots of book banning, so my question is for you guys. Uh, 
how, how do you guys feel knowing that you, your books could be banned any moment because, uh, in like schools, in libraries? How does that make you guys feel? You know, I think it makes me feel sad mm -hmm. because I think like so many of us, we write because these books weren't available to us. So the whole idea of there isn't a road, you make a road, right? Mm -hmm. And so we've made these roads and then people, the idea that people will come along and tear up the road or block the road yeah. from the people who need to get down it. Um, from the readers who need the narratives. It, it just makes me sad, and it makes me sad that, well, it, it makes me happy that people know how powerful books are and how mm. um, they can literally change the narrative for people. Um, but, but I think it's something that we really need to pay attention to and do a joint, you know, get your parents on school boards, like do the work to um, um, keep those books in classrooms because even if it's not impacting your classroom today, it might tomorrow. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, mostly it makes me sad. My book has not been banned, to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it makes me sad. I also think, um, I teach about banned books. Like I dedicate a week to teaching about banned books and like why books are banned in my classroom. Mm -hmm. um, so many banned books are written from personal experience. And I think that's what makes it hurtful, like the idea hurtful. Um, just because it, it basically feels like you're saying like my existence yep. is inappropriate. Yeah. Um, and, that, and that's hurtful to think about. How do you get the right words onto the paper? Because mm. <laughs> like sometimes you feel like you have an idea, but then you can't find the right words to like express it, the idea. What makes you think there are right words? How come the words that come out of your head aren't the right ones? I mean, but sometimes like ideas don't have words. Like, yeah. how do you take something that doesn't have words Shorty spit. and give it yeah. words to put it down? I think sometimes what happens is I have this incredible idea and I go to write and it's like the translation from my brain to the page doesn't match. And so then I'm really upset because I'm trying to chase like it's not as good as what was in my head. Mm -hmm. And what I've had to come to terms with is that once it's transferred, this is a different thing and it is never gonna be exactly what was in here. Um, and then the second thing that I'll say is that I don't try to pay attention to right words in my early drafts. That's mm -hmm. the reviser's job. Yeah. The reviser comes in and is like, we're gonna clean this up, that ain't it, that ain't it, that ain't it. But the writer, the creator, we gotta let them run, right? We give them freedom, just get it on there, make all the mess you want, that's the reviser. They better go get to work, right? And so <laughs> that difference for me, there's the maker and then there's the person who cleans up the making. Um, allows me to be really free in those early stages and then let the other person pull out the thesaurus and like get the word exact. Yeah. On that, can I just ask how, can you all each say how many revisions approximately you did for your books? I mean, I write fast and I, revi I go through the whole thing and then I go through the whole thing. I would say the Poet X probably had upwards of 20, 25 drafts. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's being like conservative. conservative yeah. yeah. I'm a slow writer and a slow reader also, if you're a Same. slow reader. Um, there's probably maybe like six very thick revisions of Saints that took a long time. Mm. Um, so that was, that was my process. I print out every draft and put it in a binder and I, it's like makes up the bottom of my bookshelf. Wow. I, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that's like corn. I don't know. Anyway. Um, but I want to say all the fighting parts was like 14. I draft really thin. So mm -hmm, that first mm -hmm. draft was less than 10,000 words, which is very, very short for a yes. verse novel. That, that's not a thing. <laughs> for a while, uh, well, was no, 12, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, no, you're right. Yeah. But uh, my novel was not a novel. Like the story was not on the page. They just get larger and larger. Mm. That is a complicated question for Grounded because we had, we were revising within, um, we were doing drafts within drafts because we had all our separate parts that we were putting together. I think we did four major ones together, but then no one was really keeping to the, like, so we would say, this is the, the that, you know, our, our draft, not right, the second draft. They'd be like, oh, no, 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 I just fixed these chapters. Can we redo it? And so it was constantly, so there must have been many within those four major drafts that we did. So Brown Girl Dreaming, was it like 30? Yeah. So, 
you know, the right words, it takes a minute for them to get yeah. on that page, but yeah. back to what everyone, especially what Liz was saying, you know, just put what's on there on there and eventually, you know, 20, 30, <laughs> 4, so at some point the right words get there. Yeah. yeah. I also think reading aloud. Yes. Read yeah. aloud yes. and that That's... will help you. My name is Aiden and I go to Brooklyn Middle School. Um, my question was, did you ever feel like there was like a challenge that you had to overcome during the pandemic? Being home with my kids. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Sorry. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, there was a, I mean, yeah, being home with my kids, <laughs> um, you know, there were losses, um, oh, yeah. you know, there were also some, some benefits too, it's different things, you know, having to change how um, we lived life was really major. So. Mm -hmm. For me, it was loneliness, actually. Mm -hmm. I lived in um, New York at the, at the start, um, and my family lived in New Jersey, so not very far. Um, but I really did not want to see them because I had roommates who were a little reckless. Mm. <laughs> and so I was so worried about getting them sick, so mm -hmm. I didn't see uh, my family and it, like I, it was lonely. It was lonely. Uh, I think I have some family that is just starting to come out of uh, still quarantining and stuff, and so that's been. I think that's been really hard. Um, and like holding that, it's difficult. Like good and difficult. Um, and then also the people that I was with, or like my husband, I feel like I got to know them so deeply. Mm -hmm. um, we had just gotten married, so then I was like, all right, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, but, um, so, but I don't know, there's a, I think it, it was so hard, but also there's, there's I hope anyway, for, uh, for some of us, we, yeah, we got to be with others and, and, and it deepens it. Sometimes going through really hard stuff together kind of shows, shows you both who you are and helps kind of <laughs> boil that down and I, I think that's I think that's true for kids too. Yeah. <laughs> what was the hardest thing for you? I would say the same thing as her because mm -hmm. I had brothers but they all had to move away to go to college and stuff mm -hmm. so I didn't really get to talk to them all that much mm -hmm. and they were always busy seeing with me so it kind of got hard but for you two you said did your kids ever expire you to make like in your books? Did my kids ever inspire like inspire you like mm -hmm in parts of it definitely I would say definitely um, I, uh, yeah they you know they inspire me just by being young people and young people are so inspiring and I think because they make me laugh a lot of the times um, that's also inspiring sometimes I'll steal a joke from them um, but, so I eavesdrop on them a lot too. yeah <laughs> Yeah, I, I still for my kids too. And Issa, some things about Feek, yeah, but you're kind of in the book as well. So like even grounded, like so. But yeah, my boys show up in my books quite a bit. Abdul's story, grounded, yes, a lot in secret. You'll, they are in the books. Okay. Can we have one more round of applause for this incredible panel? I want to thank you all for your patience, for your presence, for being here in this space. I think post-pandemic, one of the things that has become really important to me is to just mention that like, we make community happen. We make events happen together. Shout out to We Need Diverse Books for like putting this together. Um, and for all of us being present in this moment with each other, engaging in this way, like talking about books and literature, it just feels, um, I'm inspired. I'm like, I gotta go home and write. So uh, thank you for coming to the Walter Awards this year. It has been such an inspiring morning and we're grateful that you have joined us today. Many thanks to our 2024 winners and honorees. <laughs> Huge shout out to our Walter Award co-directors, the judging committee, DC Public Library, Politics and Prose, you all. The Walter Awards is now concluding, but you are welcome to stay to purchase books and get them signed in the adjoining event space. Have a wonderful, wonderful day, and thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.